The month of May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And May 2017 is special because this ABA Law Day, we are celebrating the 14th Amendment, the ratification of which will turn 150 in 2018. With that in mind, I am now speaking to Adrian Berard, the author of a book of an amazing case that brings up both the 14th Amendment and the history of Chinese Americans called Water Tossing Boulders, How a Family of Chinese Immigrants Led the First Fight to Desegregate Schools in the Jim Crow South. Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Lee. So I had never heard of Gong Lum v. Rice, which is the case that you wrote this book about. How did you come across this story? By accident. And that's embarrassing to say that I was not looking for it, but I came across it in an archive while I was researching a biography of my own great-grandmother. And she happened to be from the town where this case originated. So I had no background in law no background in Asian American history, and I came across this court case, which I had never heard of in my years working as a journalist. And so that's when the digging started to begin, because I just was researching basically my own ignorance the whole time, and the fact that I had no idea that this revelation in the landmark decision happened without any real press coverage at the time or even up until this book came out. Now, I grew up and still live in Illinois, and in the history that we were taught in U.S. history, we did talk a lot about Asians coming to America and settling in the West, but I had no idea that there was a significant Asian population in the Mississippi Delta, of all places. How did that come about? Well, it goes back into really all the way back to the dawn of slavery. But when we can trace people coming specifically to the Mississippi Delta and not throughout the Mid-South region, it's going back to emancipation. So at the time of emancipation, there were all of these unused slave ships from the Middle Passage that were then brought to southern China, used to bring contract laborers, basically indentured servants, through down the Mississippi River, um, up into New Orleans, and then also scattered throughout the Mississippi Delta. So you have this kind of legacy of slavery carrying over into the immigrant population, specifically Chinese immigrants in the American South. And I think that's something we skip over often because in our history books, the legacy of you know race relations in America is binary. We have black and white. So the introduction of a third race that's sort of a gray race in that binary relationship tends to confuse people and doesn't fit real well with an elementary school textbook. And please excuse me for quoting you back to you, but there were a couple sentences towards the middle of this book that I think will lead us into the story of this family. Martha was neither black nor white. In a society with room for only two races, Martha belonged nowhere. Behind the story of the case is this family, the Lum family. Can you talk a little bit about the Lum family? They were really incredible people, and I got to know them as a historian, which is a fascinating way to research someone. So my day job is a journalist, and I talk to living people. So researching the dead and performing an autopsy on a family in a way was really a new experience for me. But they were a family of five, a father, Ju Gong Lum, immigrated undocumented, uh, I guess we could call him an illegal immigrant if we're going to use the popular term of today. Uh, He walked across the frozen Detroit River from Canada into the United States in the early 1900s. And then he moved south where he met Catherine, who's the mother and sort of the matriarch of the family. And she was already living in the Mississippi Delta. She came as an indentured servant. She was probably about nine, between nine and 13, when she was brought to America. And she came with papers, so she came legally. And then together they had three children. And the middle child was Martha, who's the central figure in this case. And she and her sister, Berta, were kicked out of school that they had been attending for years in Rosedale, Mississippi, in the fall of 1924, September 15th. And that happened midway through the day. They were told they could no longer attend the white school and that they would be forced to the other side of town 
to attend the black school, which actually wasn't open at the time because it was still cotton season. So the black school didn't open until the end of November. So that's just a little bit about the family history. And then the relationship between the two girls was also really fascinating to me. They're very different. Berta was much more of a fighter. And so it's interesting that they casted Martha for this case. They could have picked either one of them to be the central sort of character, the plaintiff in the case, and they picked Martha, who was much more even keel. She didn't really make waves. Even her children and grandchildren have a similar disposition, which is interesting. And she just kind of kept to herself, kept the family books, was a straight-A student, and they picked her to really lead the charge with this case, which was a risky choice, but I think uh, in the end it really spoke to her character that she wanted to be front and center in this lawsuit. Now let's talk about the environment that the Lum family was in at the time. As you point out, 1924, Mississippi Delta, this was the height of the Ku Klux Klan's power. In fact, the land that the family had built their grocery store and home on was owned by a Klan member. Chu Gong was an illegal immigrant. Uh, They could lose everything by challenging the white authorities who had told them that their daughters were no longer allowed in school. Why do you think, in the face of this kind of danger, they decided to stand up and fight back? That's something to remember is when we say they could lose everything, it's financial, right? They're risking financial, they're risking the future of their children, but they're also, they're risking their lives at this point. So what we have at stake for this family is not just their business, which as you said, was owned by a member of the KKK, but it's their very lives. So we're talking about a time when it's the height of the Klan, when there are lynchings throughout the South, when there are lynchings throughout the Mississippi Delta. Homes are being burned. People are being forced from their lands for standing up for their rights. And this family decides to fight. And no one will stand with them except one lawyer in Clarksdale, Mississippi. The rest of the Chinese population in the South at the time was not standing in solidarity with this family. So they did it alone. And I think the reason they made the choice, I don't think they wanted to be revolutionary. I don't think they wanted this grand lawsuit to change the status quo necessarily. I think they just wanted to send their children to the best school possible, and this is how they wanted to do it, was by bringing this case. But in the end, I don't see them as really advocates or as fighters necessarily, so much as they were parents. The father and the mother really wanted to support their children and support those two daughters. And that's when they made that decision to fight. That's what they had in mind. So you mentioned very briefly that they had a lawyer on their side. Now, this man, Earl Brewer, was a real character in his own right. He was a former governor of Mississippi, very colorful background. What was driving him to take this case sort of in the teeth of all his white neighbors who would disapprove of this? So we have to remember that the Great Depression hit the Mississippi Delta first, and that was because they really had a huge cotton crash right around 1924 when this case was being started. So at the time, Earl Brewer, who, like you said, was a former governor, had made his fortune in cotton, and he owned land throughout Sunflower County, Mississippi, which was the county just north of where this family lived, where the case originated. So he's going through a time where none of his crop yields are high, which means all of his income that he typically gets from cotton does not exist. So he's broke. People were paying him in sacks of beans. That's how broke he was. So his family tells him, basically, you need to get out of the house and you need to start working. So he returns to this little tiny shop that he built for himself, which was his little legal office, and he starts taking any case that comes his way, which is risky, especially when you have cases like this, which, like you said, can upset the dynamic that he has with his neighbors, all the white neighbors. Again, we're talking height of the Klan. He's putting himself on a line. So part of it, I think, is he really had nothing left to lose at this point. He's broke. His reputation was already sort of lost because of a lot of advocacy that he did on behalf of inmates in the prisons throughout Mississippi. And that ostracized him from his neighbors anyway. So they found the perfect lawyer for this because it's a man that has no money and no reputation left to lose. He had actually just run for a seat in the Senate and didn't even win his home county. 
So they found the perfect lawyer to bring their case, and he actually offered to do it pro bono when they couldn't raise the funds to fight. Now, Earl Brewer was the one to decide that the 14th Amendment was what he should base his legal case on. But what I found complicated about the story, well, complicated about the time in general, is in order to win for his clients, he was not necessarily making the argument, in fact, very clearly did not make the argument that you know, Negro children, as as you say in the in the book, that that was the terminology used. Then Negro children should have the same access to facilities as white children. He had to argue basically that Martha was a citizen and that she deserved to go to the white school. And then there was this other unanswered question: What about the quote unquote colored children? And he had to basically argue that under the Mississippi state constitution which said separate schools shall be maintained for children of the white and colored races, Martha should be considered white. That's the most interesting part of this whole book, I think, is that it's racist in just about every aspect. And we're talking 1920s America, so in the segregated South, so it's understandable. But he wasn't arguing to bring down the separate but equal doctrine. He wasn't trying to overturn Plessy v. Ferguson. He was trying to say this girl is being discriminated against on account of her race, and that means she deserves to attend a segregated facility. So it's super complicated. So we have this sort of narrative about the civil rights cases that were brought under the 14th Amendment. Obviously, the most famous is Brown v. Board, and that is that we want to tear down this wall of segregation. This case complicates that because it starts the conversation, but it doesn't actually finish it. He's saying she's being discriminated against on account of her race, and that is wrong. But the right that she deserves under the 14th Amendment is to attend the white school, not the black school. So it's halfway there, right? He's not making that full holistic argument, which is it is wrong to have separate schools for separate races throughout the South. He's saying that this one Chinese race deserves access to the white schools. Even though he only went halfway, when a different Earl, Justice Earl Warren, was writing the opinion of Brown versus Board of Education, he actually cited this case. And I don't think it will be terribly surprising to our listeners to hear that, you know, the plaintiffs, the Lum family, were not successful. And if they had been successful, of course, I think that the history of school segregation would have been a little different. But even though they lost, what was the impact of this case existing and how did it lead to later court decisions? So this was a huge hurdle to get over for Thurgood Marshall because he had to combat a decision that was rendered by William Howard Taft, who's our only president to actually serve as chief justice of the Supreme Court. When Taft rendered his decision, he said, Mississippi has the right to segregate its schools but it also has the right to determine the race of its students. And that part of the decision still to this day has not been overturned, which I don't imagine that someone will push that boundary, but if it ever comes up in the courts again, just know that that is a lingering piece of this case that still remains today. But what was overturned with Brown v. Board is the segregated facilities, not the right of the states to determine the race of the students. So with this case, we have a decision that gives carte blanche to any state throughout the country to segregate its schools as it sees fit, which backfires completely, right, from what they wanted. The decision they wanted was to say, well, immigrant children, right, Chinese immigrants or other immigrant minorities throughout the South have the right to attend the white schools. That would have been the verdict coming down from the U.S. Supreme Court that would have helped this family. What we have is a devastating decision that not only gives states the power to determine the makeup of their schools and the segregation within those schools, but it takes a precedent, right? It's building a precedent that just builds on top of Plessy that says, this is an easy decision for us to make. In fact, Taft wrote that. We've already determined this as a nation, that we are all right with having segregated facilities for races throughout the South. And with that, 
you have just an outpouring of editorials in northern papers and southern papers, even on the West Coast, saying, thank you for this. We've had these sort of quid pro quo set up within our school districts, but now we have the opportunity to really legally justify segregating our school division. And some of those editorials came from places like the Los Angeles Times, right? So we're talking about not just the Deep South, not just the rural South, not just the Mississippi Delta, but we're talking about major metropolises that are now taking this case and saying, you know what, we are totally within our right to kick not only black children out of our schools, but immigrant children as well. So that's a devastating thing to have come from this case. How did the Lum family react to the United States Supreme Court decision? What was its effect on the life of Martha and her sister Berta and her brother? That's something that was interesting to me, that the effect on the family, because it actually started before the U.S. Supreme Court decision. They were most affected with the Mississippi decision, right? Because it was a state decision, and until it was overturned, the state's ruling stood. And the state ruled that they had the power to kick Martha out of school, that the school board was within its right to segregate its facilities as it saw fit. That meant that by the time it got to the Mississippi Supreme Court, we had a decision that kicked Martha out of school, and that was only a year after they filed the case. So by then, within a year, their whole lives had changed. They had moved from one side of the color line to another in the Mississippi Delta. And I should explain that they were store owners, so they're business owners within the town. They had a house that was really beautiful. They built it by hand. It was brick. It was a grocery store, but on top it had a whole apartment building that they actually rented out. So they had this eight-bedroom apartment, a store, electric lights, which was a big deal for the Delta at the time, running water. And when they were moved out of the white school, they lost access to that power structure that they had. So their banker was white, obviously. He's the man, Walter Sillers, who we have records that he was affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan. So they're losing their banker, who had the mortgage on their house. They're losing their access to churchgoers, who at the time were really the power structure as well. So the white Methodist church that they attended, they were no longer welcome at. And they're ostracized from a community that had really let them get a livelihood. So now they're forced into poverty, which is not abnormal. I should say that they're forced into a poverty that was just a daily existence for the African-American population in the Mississippi Delta at the time. So for them, it was hard to literally over the course of a year move from being wealthy, part of the white power structure, into the despotism and the abject poverty that is the other side of the tracks, right? the sharecropping community, the black sharecroppers in the South. That happened to them very quickly. It wasn't over generations. It was basically over the course of a year. And so they moved to the Arkansas Delta because it was a different state, and at least there wasn't that precedent. And from there, they opened up a tiny grocery, but they didn't have running water. They had very little access to food even, so they were hungry. They obviously didn't have electricity. So there was an extreme change in what the family was experiencing before this case and after this case. And they, that's what they would tell their children. So they wouldn't necessarily talk about the case too much when I was interviewing children and grandchildren, but they would talk about what it was like to live in the Arkansas Delta after this case and how hard it was for them to even just get by. So, Adrian, you aren't a lawyer. You're a journalist and obviously an historian. All of these stories that, as, you know, we both said, we weren't taught in school, the stories of the Chinese Americans and the other Asian Americans in the South, are these histories being preserved? These histories are being preserved and that families are doing their best to preserve them. But that's something to remember. And again, I also wasn't trained as a historian before I picked up this book. So I did a lot of learning as I went. But something I did learn is that history is kept by those who determine what is most meaningful in a society. So the records of the immigrant families and the minority families in the Mississippi Delta were really hard to come by. So families built their own archives relatively strong archives over time and that they kept certain deeds to properties because they had to, some letters that were meaningful, and a couple photographs. 
But when we look at somebody like Earl Brewer, right, the lawyer in this case who was a former governor, I have what he ate for breakfast every day when he was at the governor's mansion. I have every last little detail. I know his calisthenic routine for his health and fitness. So we have some people who we have every record possible, and we have other people in this book who had to work exceptionally hard to get even the most mundane part of their lives brought out. So that's something to remember, too, going forward. You know, now I'm doing a better job of recording family histories of people around me because those stories pass off when people die. Now, I do have a question about the title of your book, Water Tossing Boulders. How did you come to choose that as representing this story? I didn't want to make a declarative sentence when choosing the title of the book. I didn't want to determine whether this was a victory or a failure because in my mind, it was a little bit of both. And that's a hard sell for a title, right? And you want the victory scene. You want that powerful moment of everybody leaving and feeling good. And we have that happy high five. We've done it. I never had that in this story. It's much more complicated. So I just started thinking about what is a small thing that can eventually create a big thing. And in my mind, I thought of water, right? That it's made up of a lot of little droplets. So I turned to Chinese literature because I wanted to make sure that the Lum family was front and center. And in The Art of War, there is this beautiful passage that says, when torrential water tosses boulders, it is because of its momentum. And that's what got me to the title of the book, was it's water tossing boulders. So we have just a little drop of water that eventually is picked up, and the 14th Amendment is used in subsequent cases to really bring that boulder that tears down that wall of segregation in the South. But that's not what this case set out to do, and that's not what it was. It was just one little drop and a larger waterfall that eventually would move that boulder. It was hard when reading your book not to think about the ways in which the 1920s and the situation with immigration then is really being reflected today. In fact, I believe the Trump administration cited a 1923 or 1924 law establishing racial quotas for immigration. What echoes do you see now in what the Lum family was facing back in the 1920s? They're everywhere. I mean, the reverberations throughout this book are just speaking exactly to what is happening today. And it's a little bit terrifying because I didn't predict that. I started this book six years ago, so I couldn't have seen that this would be so relevant now. In fact, I had trouble justifying it to my publisher that it would be relevant. So right before this case was brought, in the spring of 1924, U.S. Congress and Chester B. Arthur president signed into law the most extensive and restrictive immigration law ever passed. And it remains so to this day, although there could be one forthcoming for all I know. What we have is the first time The U.S. determines the racial makeup that it values most in this country and then sets immigration quotas based on that. So it used a census from 1890, and it said this is the racial makeup that we want to continue to project in the future of this country, and we will allow immigrants based on the percentage that they made up of the population in the 1890s. So we're restricting based on race. And one of the largest restrictions, the most impacted, were the Chinese immigrants. They basically excluded them completely. The entire working class of Chinese Americans was put in jeopardy. And literally overnight, they were sent home. So when we talk about something like the travel ban and how it you know, wrangled airports and lawyers are flocking into these areas, that's exactly what happened in ports throughout the country after this became law in 1924. The patterns that we see in the 1920s are so clearly being replicated today. And part of that is just the political climate. We have a growing political base that is influenced by the Klan at this point. There's a lot of rhetoric in the media about the fear of the immigrant, that the immigrant is notoriously a criminal, And that fear is projected into legislation. So we have to remember that the rhetoric that's created in the media, and I'm cognizant of this as a journalist now, can really become law 
very quickly. You know, it's a matter of years that this rhetoric circulates about the Chinese immigrant before they are excluded entirely from our country. Well, that's incredibly sobering. Adrian, if people are interested in picking up your book, how can they do so? It's available on Amazon. I always like to say that. <laughs> but it's also distributed by Random House, so it's any even smaller bookstores are carrying it now. So there's access to it at any Barnes & Nobles, any larger bookseller will have it. But smaller bookstores will also have access to it. And my husband's a librarian, so I should say there are plenty of public libraries throughout the South that are now carrying it. That's wonderful. I'll also note, because I downloaded this, that there is an audiobook version of the book, which I listen to as I commute and, and can recommend. And if people are interested in getting in touch with you, how could they do so? Do you have any social media? I do. I'm on Twitter, Adrian Berard, and I'm also on Facebook, Adrian Berard, and I have my own website, which is adrianberard.com. Adrian, thank you so much for being our guest today. This was an incredibly enlightening book. For our listeners, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. Remember to rate and subscribe on iTunes.